Good afternoon, my name is Chris Allen from Youth Pledge for Employers. I'm delighted to be joined by Anne Wright from Air Power East. Hello to Anne. Hi, how are you? Yes, I'm not too bad yourself. Great, it's Monday. <laughs> well, thank you. It is, it is Monday, yeah. So let, let's, let's start the week as we need to go on positively. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thank you for giving me your time to speak to me this afternoon. And I guess my first question has to be, can you tell me about Air, Air Power East and what it is you do? Yeah, uh, well, Air Power East is a small company um, formed about 35 years ago by the managing director Richard Sewell and is joined now by three other directors. The company is a compressed air engineering company based in Suffolk in Stanton and the purpose of the organisation is to sell, install, service and maintain compressed air equipment. So if anyone doesn't really know what that is, the most simplest analogy is a compressor to blow up a tyre to start with, which is a small piston unit. And then just sort of imagine the whole process from growing some produce such as a lettuce and how things are manufactured and processed in factories where they'll go on conveyor belts where there's compressed air running them and then they're bagged and put into the supermarkets and they're transported from companies that need compressed air to run them equipment in engineering so about 90 percent of industrial companies have compressed air so it's uh it's um, a big market although i knew nothing about it when i first joined <laughs> <laughs> That's, a lot of people fall into the roles and sectors like that where as you say you don't know they exist and as soon as you start describing the purposes obviously i'm, I'm thinking oh my god there's I say so many uses for it, but yes. it's it's not it's not something I even would have known existed as a business, you know, unless, um, unless you told me. And what kind of sort of roles and people do you have with in the organisation to facilitate, you know, all the you know all those different kinds of um, equipment and manufacturing where compressed air could be used? Well, we have um, salespeople, so they have to go out and find customers um, either by telephone out on the road, dock, knocking on doors, marketing. So you've got marketing support that goes with that. And when someone sells a piece of equipment, you have to pr produce the paperwork. So someone needs to process it internally. So we have um, people to coordinate that and administer. And then you've got someone that will actually do the finance side of that. So they'll send out the invoices, collect the money or chase the money and do the banking and do the accounts work. So you've got quite a few roles that are already just to support the sales team. Then you've got to install the equipment. You've got engineers who will assess the jobs and work out how they're going to install the equipment. Having received this massive piece of equipment, maybe sort of 50, 60 kilos or more, much more in weight, we have to get it to the customer, install it in there, maybe in a factory, so work out the time of day to do that, when's best, um, interrupting maybe the processing or having to do it around when they run. And the engineers will maybe be a one person or a team of two or three that would do installation work. And their paperwork has to be created and managed by the service coordinating team. So then you've got people who go out and service the equipment, which is done on a regular basis. Um, maybe it's monthly, monthly checks, it might be quarterly, biannually. And then you've got someone who has to organise all the parts for that person. So we order the parts and then the parts come in and you've got someone in the warehouse in the stores who's responsible for unpacking the work, checking it, distributing it, allocating it to an engineer for their job. So it's it's a sort of a, a fairly streamlined operation when you think about it and everybody's got a role in that company to make that job happen and that sort of brings me on to well what else is there there's myself that does the HR I also do the health and safety and the risk assessments um, that go with that I do the corporate work I will do compliance work um, for example insurance um, what customers require for their information from us about who we are and are we accredited to do the work we say we're going to do, are our engineers qualified to do the work they do, all those sorts of things. So that's the sort of types of work that detail behind the sale and the installation that goes on in the company. So I think sort of 
in terms of roles and responsibilities, I think I've pretty much covered off what we've got. <laughs> Oh, Possibly. definitely. So many roles and so and I say in so many res different responsibilities well broken down. So no, thank you. That was that was brilliant. <laughs> and if you know, you touched on earlier saying that, you know, this is maybe a, a you know, a sector or an area which, you, you know, you didn't know exist uh, existed. And, you know, I know it's one that, I, you know, I'm not familiar with. And I'm not saying that, you know, you didn't wake up, you know, you didn't um, dream when you were younger of saying, you know, well, I want to work in HR for Air Power East <laughs> one day. You know, so what was your sort of career path into the role you're in now? Well, my career path started out in the employment service, actually. Um, so I was a civil servant. I was an administrator and I was promoted and became an executive officer. And I decided to spread my wings a bit. I, I was young and I applied for a job in London because I really fancied it. And it was working for the for the um, civil service um, sports council because I thought, well, that sounds exciting. It's sports. So <laughs> off I went commuting by train to London and back from Suffolk, which took, I think, about two hours each way round trip, <laughs> which I did for about six God. months <laughs> and then decided I better move. <laughs> and <laughs> in that job, I learned accounts. And I didn't actually see much sports apart from having a few opportunities to get out and about and a few freebie tickets to go to places. Um, <laughs> but I was I was actually ticking off people's subscriptions and doing the accounts work. So but it was a good skill. That was great. So from there, I then got a promotion in London to into training. So I worked for the training agency or the training organisation. I won't tell you the names because they keep changing. But basically, my job was to encourage employers to develop their people. Um, you may have heard of something called investors in people in the past. That was a process where from the managing director downwards, everybody would be engaged in development of people and have training plans to um, to actually help individuals find to, to improve their skills, basically. So that's what I used to do. I used to go out and present that and get people to sign up. And I had lots of training in order to get me to get out in front of people to do that. So it had its moments. It was a bit scary on occasion. I was still quite young at that time, but um, I did it and I really enjoyed it. And from there, I went to the training and enterprise councils and I was doing marketing and corporate work there. So I used to run lots of um, training events and helping actually young people getting into training opportunities as well. Um, people who may not have had um, a university opportunity, but wanted a vocational and education training route. So that was I was doing these masterclass events for employers, but I was also doing youth programs and promotions and having some fun in that process of set up events to to work with young people, which was fun and good and a great experience. So from there, I've really focused more on marketing and did a, a, a well, not a degree in marketing, but I did a diploma in marketing. And I then did a general management qualification. So I studied the Open University and got myself a diploma in management. So that's my career path then became more general management. And I came back to East Anglia around about, I can't remember the year exactly, but I came back about 20 years ago and I helped run an environment centre and get that going and set up using general management skills. So I wasn't an environmental specialist, although I learned a lot along the way, um, but I used my core skills in people management, administration, finance, and those skills that uh, general general management skills that I needed um, for that. And that's where I from after that job, I had a little change of plan that wasn't planned. I actually had um, a bit of a blip when I had an accident in the car and I couldn't commute for a while. So that's when I joined local company because I didn't have to drive. Um, but I saw an opportunity to use my skills in a smaller company, but to use them in a really good way and to help that company along. So that's that's where and when I joined. So it wasn't necessarily a chosen career path, but I've now been there 20 years and really enjoy it. And if we look at actually at so 
if you were going to be giving some advice to say a young person look at this and you know as you sort of said there you know your career path has been far from straight and I mean that in the nicest possible way in terms of as you say yeah. you want these different parts and learn these different skills you know what would be your right I missed some of that but um what would be my advice to younger people would that be yeah so what would be your advice to younger people who um you know who are maybe thinking you know that as I say they might be worried that if they don't stay in one particular role for the you know their whole life you know whereas as you said you've gained a lot um, of benefits from working different roles and gaining different core skills that have become part of your core skill set. So, mm. you know, in your current role now, what would you say are the sort of skills you've plucked from other roles you've been in which you use the most? Um, I would probably say for myself at the moment, probably people skills. So that would be managing people and and developing and training. They would be the, the key ones at the moment. And I've been doing quite a lot of recruitment recently and so it's I've I've seen lots and lots of different applications for jobs and people coming from different backgrounds with different skills and so they that's a really really good strength to have in the people people HR side and I guess it served you well in it could serve people well in a multitude of careers and sectors I know as say within the HR role you're in now it must be you know fit very well but I'm guessing that people skills and you know the ability to manage and work with people is a transferable skill that you've utilized throughout your career mm, yes yeah it's a it's a communication skill and it's a you know it's it, not everybody likes it or enjoys it it's um because you have to deal with confrontation as well and you know discipline and all sorts of stuff um but it's you know generally you need to be able to relate and talk to people and I think it's I quite enjoy it um, I don't want to tell anybody off. No one ever does. You know, <laughs> what I like to see is I get a kick out of seeing someone do well and it develop. That's what I like to see. I mean, and and speaking about people developing, it leads me quite well on my nice, uh, to my final question, actually. And I've um, asked this to all the employees I've spoken to. And we mentioned earlier about maybe the advice you might give to um, younger people. If you could go back Anne, and speak to, say, 17, 18 year old Anne, you know, you know, you're about to go out on your career journey, you know, take into account the successes you've had, mistakes you might have made and learned from. What is the one piece of career advice you would give, go back and give your younger self? I would say um, study a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Get up, the, yeah. Get your head down. Keep studying. Don't give up. Um, always carry on with your development. Um, because I started off, I sort of left school because um, I had the opportunity to leave school with GCSEs. Um, but I went into the open university routes rather than having the opportunity to stay on and do my A levels and then go to university. But I think it's important to keep studying. You don't have to go to university. You can continue to study and get skills. And even it's just an evening class or a sport or a other hobby where you can get some development by being with people and by doing something different that maybe takes you out of your comfort zone. And I think that's a really good development. So there's ways of learning that don't have to be in a college or in front of um you know in a group you can do things in a in a way you know you could learn a new sport or you could you could um help people um and volunteer and i would do that younger definitely <laughs>